Take out your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to Acts 18. Acts 18. We're starting a new chapter today. Acts 17 saw the Apostle Paul preaching to the men on Mars Hill in Athens. And the response to the gospel is the same response we're getting today. Some people mock. Some people, they said, ah, you know, we just want to hear a little bit more. And some accepted. Some accepted Christ for salvation. The people who delayed and postponed making a decision for Christ in chapter 17, verse 32, may have passed up their only opportunity because Paul moved on. He, he left Corinth right after that, and he is going to move on, or he left Athens, and he moves on to Corinth. And that's where we pick up with the Apostle Paul today. Now, you're familiar with Corinth, and I'm going to give you a little bit of background to the city itself. But the way that we're the most familiar with Corinth is because there are two epistles in the New Testament, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, that are written to the church that would have been started in Acts 18. So what we're looking at has further impact much later on in Scripture. So Paul leaves Athens... And he moves on to Corinth in verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Let me show you on the map here where we are. Now, <clears throat> right here, you see Asia there on the map. That right there is, we would call that modern-day Turkey. And then you have between Turkey and Greece, you have the Aegean Sea. And if you were to carry on up through there, going up from the Aegean Sea, that takes you up into the Black Sea. And then when you get up into the Black Sea, you're right up against Ukraine, which is something that we're hearing a lot about in the news. So we're in Greece. So you see Athens here is on the, on the eastern side. And so Paul's journey, it's about a 53-mile walk to get from Athens over to Corinth. So... And say 53 miles is a long walk, well, not compared to a lot of the walks that the Apostle Paul took. If Athens could be considered the hub of Greek culture, it's where many of the, the philosophers and, and such of, of years and years past were. But if Athens is the hub, the, the central headquarters of Greek culture, then Corinth is very definitely one of the main hubs of Greek political thought and commerce. Corinth is located on an isthmus. Now, I'm not going to say that word a whole lot because it makes a mess on the platform here. But it's on an isthmus that runs uh, between there and, and there's, a, there's a sea. There's called the Corinthian Gulf. And there's, it's a four-mile stretch of land that connects this portion here in Greece. It is the Peloponnesian Peninsula with the rest of Greece, for those who are into geography. Corinth had been the capital of Achaia, but it was destroyed in 146, and then it was rebuilt in 46 BC by Julius Caesar. And so it had some, some cultural impact there, but any traffic that was going between northern and southern Greece had to go through Corinth. If you're going by land, there is no other way. You have to go up on this little four-mile stretch of land where the city of Corinth is. There were also, because there were two bodies of water on either side of this little isthmus, uh, there were some ships who, rather than make a 200-mile trip around the Greek mainland, that, for smaller ships anyway, they would beach the ship they would drag it up on shore, and they had a, a system of log rollers that went four miles. And so they would beach their ships, take them up, and take the overland route past Corinth. So it's a hub of commerce either way you go. Ships, foot traffic, all of that goes through, so obviously they become very wealthy. But Corinth, in spite of all of her wealth, had something of a reputation in the ancient world. Being on the coast meant that many of the people who lived there were sailors and the rougher classes of society. They were very a very transient population. A lot of people who lived in Corinth, they, they weren't living on the home place where their grandparents had lived. They were living there because they had to be there for a two-year period of time for commerce reasons. 
the term Corinthian, it came to mean a profligate or a libertine, a rogue or a sensualist. When somebody would call you, well, they say, you're just a Corinthian. That was a pretty high insult. That means that you have no moral character. That means that you're cheap and loose. To Corinthianize <laughs> meant to practice immorality. When the name of your town becomes synonymous with immoral behavior, you're doing something wrong. A Corinthian girl was a term that was used for one of the thousands of women who served in the temple of Artemis or Venus, which rose on the Acropolis outside of Corinth. So you have the city, and then there's a hill, and on the top of the hill, there's the temple of Diana or Artemis or Venus. She went by many names. And, and at night, as the, as the sun would go down, the women from the temple, they were called, they were the temple prostitutes, and they would come down into the city, and Artemis or Diana or Venus was worshipped in the act of immorality. So Corinth is known for this. So it's into this cultural cesspool that Paul comes right after he leaves Athens. So he, he comes from kind of the, the pinky out society, kind of the, the rarefied air, the, the high, high class people in Athens, and he's 53 miles west and he comes to Corinth. Totally different, totally different type of people. Same message of the gospel, as we'll see, but totally different type of, of person lived in Corinth than lived in Athens. As he makes this trip, we find out from other scriptures, actually when we read in 1 Corinthians, we'll get there in just a moment, as Paul made this trip, he's depressed. He's wrung out. He's tired. <laughs> You'd say, why is he tired? Well, again, he's walking 53 miles, but this has been a rough trip. If you think about it, when he, when he was in Asia Minor, he kept every town he goes into, they have a revival or a riot, and sometimes both, and he gets chased out of town and, and beaten in Philippi. All sorts of things have happened on this trip, and he finally, he's, he's making his way from Athens to Corinth, and he's wrung out. Since the beginning of this missions trip, actually before it even started, when they were still in Antioch of, of Syria, there were... There were problems. He's been chased out of cities. He's faced opposition everywhere he's gone. Sometimes the persecution has gotten physical. He's been beaten. He's been put in stocks. He's been kept in the inner sanctum of the prison. Paul is wrung out. It's been a rough few months that he's made this trip. Recalling his entrance into Corinth years later, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1, he said, And I, brethren... When I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. When Paul shows up in this, again, moral cesspool of a city, he's tired. He's exhausted. He's been through the ringer, as it were, physically. Literally, he's been through a lot. He's tired, emotionally, mentally, perhaps even spiritually. <clears throat> One commentator, he described Corinth, the city of Corinth, as an undeniably rip-roaring town where none but the tough could survive. And here comes Paul. And he's already running on empty. When he walks into the city, he's tired. He's, he's trembling, according to, to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 3. He's, he's whooped, to put it in <laughs> some vernacular. But God foresaw the needs of his weary servant. And when Paul got to Corinth, he quickly crossed paths with a couple. Their names are Aquila and Priscilla, and we're introduced to them in verse 2. He comes into town and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So what do we know about Priscilla and Aquila? They were introduced to them a little bit. 
He's a Jew, Aquila at least, very likely the same for Priscilla. He's a Jew who was born in Pontus. Let me show you where Pontus is on a map. So this is, again, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Up here against the Black Sea, you have a little region called Pontus. That's where Aquila is born. But then it says, lately come from Italy. So he's born in Pontus, but he comes from a region that is not even on this map. It would, be, it would be over here. He comes from Italy. More specifically, he comes from Rome. We're not told why he had actually gone to Italy, why he'd taken his wife, but we're told why they left. It says there, it's in, it's in parentheses in verse 2, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. The emperor Claudius reigned in Rome from 41 until 54 AD. And there were about 20,000 Jews who were living in the city of Rome and in its, its immediate area. And these Jews there in Rome, as has been the experience of the Apostle Paul all throughout the book of Acts, they're prone to riots. They, they would have something that would happen that would offend their sensibilities and rather than seek a peaceful redress of grievances, they would mob in the streets and they would, they would cause issues. They would cause unrest. And so finally, Claudius, the emperor of Rome, he says, look, if you're going to tear up the city, then you can just get out. And he, and he expels all of the Jewish population, again, 20,000 people, he expels them from Rome. So Priscilla and Aquila... I, I don't think they were involved in the rioting, given what we know of their character here and in other places. But they're, they're caught up as well. They're kicked out of Rome as well. They're, they're displaced persons. They don't go back to Pontus. Rather, they come here and maybe they had been on a ship that stopped in Corinth. We don't know exactly how they got here. But scholars believe that Paul made his way to Corinth in the fall, about 51 A.D. So that also coincides with around the same time that Claudius kicked the Jews out of Rome. It's probable that Priscilla and Aquila had not been in Corinth very long when they met up with the Apostle Paul. So you could make the case, we know that Paul is tired, and Priscilla and Aquila had had to leave under less than desirable circumstances as well. They were displaced. They didn't get a long pre-warning to leave their home. And so they find themselves in Corinth. And Paul has come to Corinth. So you have a, a worn-out couple and a worn-out preacher meeting up in the moral cesspool of Corinth. We're not informed also of how this couple or when this couple came to know Jesus as their Savior. It's very possible that Paul led them to the Lord upon his arrival in Corinth, but probably more likely is that they were already believers when they arrived in Corinth. And again, we, as we move forward, this is the first that we will hear of Priscilla and Aquila, but not the last. Verse 3 tells us that all three of them, Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla, were tent makers. You say, what does it take to make a tent? Especially back then, tents were kind of just a sheet. Well, the tents, they were usually made out of leather, or they, they had a special way that they would weave goat's hair together to make tent, uh, and it, it would be water repellent and, and such. And so Paul and Priscilla and Aquila involved in the same occupation as tent makers, so they're, they're working and sewing and doing all of this, and they're together there, and, and they're able to encourage one another. We have, uh, again, a worn-out preacher and two displaced persons who meet in this, this pretty rough city. And the ministry continues on. There, there's a lesson here. Paul is tired. He's worn out. But the ministry goes on. He still has a burden for the lost souls that surround him. Even though he took some time to work alongside this couple in their profession of tent making... He didn't neglect his true calling because while Paul may have earned his paycheck making tents, his business was preaching the gospel. 
And there's no denying that, especially as we've gone through the book of Acts. Look at verse 4. And he, speaking of Paul, reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, persuading the Jews and the Greeks. Well, isn't that surprising? <laughs> Paul comes to a new city, and as he is wont to do, he goes to the synagogue. He goes to the synagogue there on the Sabbath, on Saturday, and that's where you find Paul. He's there, he's preaching, he's telling the Jews about Jesus. It says he persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now, it's interesting because Paul is in Greece, so everyone that he meets is a Greek. So this word has a little bit more, uh, more definition to it. This word, when it says that he's in the synagogue persuading Jews and Greeks, Greeks is referring to a proselyte. A proselyte is a Greek who has converted to Judaism, and they're, they're worshiping in the synagogue as well. So all religious people, because non-religious people don't go to the synagogue on Saturdays in Corinth. So he's ministering to the, the Jews who believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he's ministering to the Greeks who believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 5, the first part of the verse and when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, look, Paul's right there. Where, where were they? Why weren't they with him the whole time? Well, because Paul had left Silas and Timothy behind in Berea. If you look back at the last chapter in verse 14, it says that he left them when he went from Berea to Athens. But as soon as he got to Athens, he said, I need you guys to come. Well, Paul left Athens faster than they could make the trip, so they finally catch up to him here in, uh, in Corinth. So Timothy and Silas catch up to him, second part of verse 5, and Paul was pressed in the spirit, testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Paul's ministry to the Jews was heavy on his heart. He's He's not able to get past this. Paul looks at these Jews who are living in a godless society, and he sees these Jews meeting in the synagogue every Saturday, and they're trying to earn favor with God. They're, they're abiding by the laws of Moses as best they can and the traditions of the fathers, and, and they're, they're doing the best that they can with what they've got, where they are, but... They're still trying to earn salvation. And, and Paul knows something about this because if you remember before Paul became the apostle Paul, he was known as Saul of Tarsus and he was a Pharisee. He had been, he had been up to his neck in works-based salvation. He was trying to earn salvation. And so he understands the, the futility, the hopelessness of the Jews who are meeting in the synagogue and it burdens him. He's pressed in his spirit. He often opens his epistles with the words grace and peace. It's interesting that when you start talking about works salvation, there's never any peace. For someone who is trying to earn salvation by being good or doing certain rituals, there's always the nagging question in the back of their mind, well, how, how much is enough? How good is good enough? When can I be sure that I've done enough to earn salvation? And, of course, the answer we know from Scripture is you can't because you can't earn salvation. But Paul often speaks of grace and peace when he opens his epistles. When he wrote in, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3, he said, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a reason that he says it like this. Grace and peace. Because the peace of God can only go where the grace of God has already been experienced. Someone who is trying to earn salvation by works will have no peace. Only one who has experienced the grace of Jesus Christ can have that peace deep and lasting and abiding peace that Paul speaks of and that all of scripture refers to. So Paul, as he looks at these Jewish people meeting in the synagogue, he's pressed in the spirit, he's burdened by the lostness of his fellow Jews. 
And it causes him to redouble his efforts to share the gospel with him. He's not, he's, he's tired, he's worn out, he's exhausted, but he's not going to ease up because, well, he can't. He actually talks about it in 1 Corinthians 9, 16. This pressing in the spirit is not something new. He says, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Why did Paul preach like he did? Why is it that you couldn't shut this man up? They beat him. They stoned him. They threw him in stocks. They put him in, in the bad part of the jail. But they couldn't stop his preaching the gospel. Why? Well, because of this. Because he says, I, I have to preach the gospel. I have to share the truth with those who don't know it. He says in 2 Corinthians 5.14, For the love of Christ constraineth us. To, to constrain means to force, to push into. He says, I preach because the love of Christ requires it. It constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. That he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Why couldn't you shut Paul up with the gospel? Well, because he had experienced the darkness of being lost and trying to earn salvation. Then he experienced the light and the joy and the peace and the forgiveness and the, the, the taking away of all that guilt. And he says, I have to tell people about this. If I don't tell people, I'm going to bust. I have to speak the truth. Romans 1.14, he kind of gives his, his perspective. He says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. The Apostle Paul could not walk past anyone, man, woman, child, everyone who he walked past. He felt this deep burden. He says, I owe this person. No, he didn't owe the money. I owe this person. I've received so much light. I have so much truth that God has blessed me with. I'm a debtor. I have to speak to this person. I have to share the gospel with them. They're, they're on their way to a Christless eternity. I have to speak to them. I'm a debtor. In his ministry, he not only preached the gospel, he testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ, but he also answered their questions. Verse 4 that we've already looked at, says that he reasoned. He reasoned with them. That, that word has at its base, it, the, the root of that word is the word dialogue. He talked with people. It, it was not just Paul standing up and preaching the gospel. Of course, he did preach the gospel, but then when people came to him after, they said, hey, how does what you're saying about Jesus fit with what I know from the Old Testament? He, he would lay it out for them. He would dialogue. He would discuss. He would reason with them. He's speaking truths that many of these people had never heard. And he's prepared to answer questions. We talked about this in Sunday school. That we are to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks us a reason of the hope that's in us with meekness and fear. That was written by Peter, but Paul practiced it as well. He's ready to give an answer. But the message of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus the Christ was met again with opposition. Look at verse 6. And when they opposed themselves, who's this talking about? The Jews and the Greeks in the synagogue. So the Jews and the believing Greeks in the synagogue, they opposed themselves and blasphemed. So Paul shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. And henceforth, I will go to the Gentiles. They oppose themselves. That, that word, it means to array for battle. Who are they fighting against? Who are they arraying themselves for battle? It says they oppose themselves. The, they're target practicing in a circle here. They're, 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 not doing, they're not doing what's even logically making sense. 
The first casualty when someone rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ is that person. Did, did they hurt Paul by rejecting Christ? Well, only so much that he really wanted them to accept his Savior. But, but they didn't do lasting damage to Paul. But they condemned themselves. The Jews of Corinth set themselves to battle with Paul and they began to blaspheme the name of Jesus. Blasphemy means to revile, to, to speak reproachfully, to speak evil of. They're insulting Jesus in the presence of the Apostle Paul. And in rejecting him, in rejecting Jesus Christ, who, according to John 14, 6, is the way, the truth, the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. When the Jews of Corinth said, we don't want anything to do with your Jesus, they're rejecting the only means of salvation. If you were bitten by a coral snake, they're highly dangerous, very venomous. You're bitten by a, a coral snake and you saw it bite you. You know that it put its venom into you and you uh, immediately medical aid comes to you and you say, I I want you to help me, but I don't want anything to do with anti-venom. Well, you, you don't understand. The, the only other option is to drain all the blood out of you, which that will kill you too. Okay? You, you, you can't reject the only means of salvation and still be saved. The Jews are saying, we don't want anything to do with this Christ, this Jesus that you're talking about. And in so doing... They're, they're blocking themselves. Again, they're opposing themselves. They're cutting themselves off from the only means of salvation. Speaking of Jesus in Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you don't get to heaven through the shed blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you don't get to heaven. In, in shutting themselves off to the message, the gospel of Jesus, these Jews, in opposing themselves, they condemn themselves. In response to this blasphemous vitriol that's against his Savior, Paul shakes his raiment. This is fulfillment of, uh, of Luke 9, verse 5. Jesus was speaking. He said, And whosoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. That's what Paul's doing here. He says to the Jews, look, you don't want Jesus? You want me to shut up about Jesus? I can't. But in, in your rejecting Jesus, in your rejecting the message that I bring you, you've condemned yourselves. There's nothing more that I can do. <clears throat> His condemnation had three parts. He says, first off, your blood be upon your own heads. This is alluding to a passage in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 33, verse 2, this is God speaking to the prophet. And God says, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land, land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. What, what's, what's he saying? Well, if you have a watchman who you've set up to say, hey, blow, this, blow the trumpet when the enemy's coming. And then the watchman blows the trumpet because the enemy's coming, and you say, I wish he'd shut up with that noise. It's early in the morning. Why, why is he blowing that trumpet? Well, he's blowing the trumpet because you, you're paying him to. You asked him to blow the trumpet, and you don't listen. You don't do anything, and then the enemy comes. They sweep through the town, and, and you're dead. Who's to blame? Well, that stupid watchman. If he would have just... No, the watchman did what he was supposed to. The watchman blew the trumpet. You didn't listen. That's what Paul is. He's a watchman. He's blowing the trumpet. He's saying, look, Jesus Christ is the only way. Your works-based salvation won't cut it. You're, you're trying to earn God's favor will not work. You have to have Jesus. And they say, but we don't want your Jesus. And so Paul says to them, there's nothing more I can do. Your blood's on your own heads. 
He, he goes further. He says, I am clean. Is he making a personal hygiene statement here? No, he's, he's saying that I've done all that I can. My hands are clean, as it were. In Acts 20, verse 6, he's going to say, we'll get there eventually. He says, wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. That is an extraordinary statement that goes hand in glove with what we're reading here. Paul is able to look at a city of, of people and say, I'm clean. I've done all that I can do. There's no one in Corinth who Paul had deliberately passed up with the opportunity to share Christ. He says, your blood be on your own heads. I'm clean. From henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. Now, this is not the Apostle Paul swearing off of Jewish evangelism. He's not saying, look, I'm never going to talk to another Jew again. As a matter of fact, if you read ahead, one of the next towns that he goes in, guess where he goes first? The synagogue, because that's kind of his thing. Okay? He's not saying that. He's saying in this city, in this particular setting, I'm done. The, the primary focus of his ministry is the Gentiles anyway. After all, he's ministering in Greece, which is a Gentile nation predominantly. The Gentiles will become his more singular focus. If you look ahead to the very last chapter of Acts, and you look at some of the last verses in the book of Acts, Paul is speaking to the Jews in Rome as a prisoner, and he declares in Acts 28.28, be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. What does they will hear it mean? They're not going to do what the Jews have done in every town. They're not going to lead a, a riot and mob and, and chase Paul out of town and chase the, others, the other evangelists of the gospel. They're going to be open to it. The Jews... They oppose themselves. They close themselves off to the gospel. But the Gentiles, they're ready to receive. The Jews are too proud to hear the message of the gospel. They believe that their heritage was enough to save them, but it's not. The fact that they're sons of Abraham doesn't matter. It doesn't matter your heritage. Your good works are not enough to save you. Your religious observance, traditionalism, they're not enough to save you. In order to be saved, you need Jesus. But the Jews won't have it. But the Gentiles are starving for this message of hope and deliverance, and Paul is going to see to it that they hear the message. Paul is going to expend every effort to get the gospel to these who have open hearts. And so he changes his venue in verse 7. And he departed thence. He leaves the synagogue. <laughs> Look how far he made it. He departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined part to the synagogue. How far did Paul make it? He went next door. <laughs> he, he makes it out the door of the synagogue, and he goes to the next house over, and he finds Justice. This man, Justice, probably a proselyte, a Greek who had converted to Judaism, who, had, who then accepted Christ and became a Christian. And so rather than the synagogue, now the home of justice is going to be his basis of operation, verse 8. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. This was an earthquake in Corinth. This is, this is earth shattering. Paul leaves the synagogue. He says, I'm going to the Gentiles. He goes next door. He leads justice to the Lord. And then the ruler of the synagogue, Crispus, this man who, I don't know if Paul kind of had one of the windows open between the houses or, or how exactly he worked it, but the gospel took root in the heart and the mind of this leader of the synagogue. And now he's trusted the Lord. This is a blow to the religious establishment, for sure. It wasn't just Christmas. It was his entire household. 
And the household of Crispus was only the first domino to fall because it says many of the Corinthians heard. They hear what happens and they also trust Christ and are baptized. Just as a note there, I want to pick up the, the low-hanging fruit as we go. They believed and were baptized. Baptism is not part of salvation. Baptism is a step of obedience following salvation. Water cannot and does not wash away sin. What can, take, what, what can wash away my sin? Well, nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's the, the blood of Christ takes away sin. And, and water is just a picture. Water is just a means of identification. We're not done with the Apostle Paul's ministry here in Corinth. Verse 11, if you look at it, says that he would actually be in Corinth for a year and a half which is a lot longer than he spent in those places. When he arrived in Corinth, he was tired. 1 Corinthians 2.3 tells us, in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. When he got to Corinth, he was bushed. And he meets up with this, this other couple. It's interesting that on his first missionary journey, he had traveled with Barnabas. Barnabas was called the son of consolation. He was an encourager. But then Paul was even separated from the companions that he did have. He was separated from Timothy and Silas. They were back in Berea and making their way to Athens. And Paul goes alone to Corinth. And he's tired and he's walking into a town that eats people and chews them up and spits them out. But God knew that Paul had this need. And God brought Priscilla and Aquila from Pontus, by way of Italy. That's like me going to Washington by way of Trenton. Okay? That, it's, it's a, that's, that's not how you get there the fastest way. No, but God was working. God brought this couple who were displaced and very likely discouraged themselves and puts them together with the apostle who's been chased out of the finest towns in, in Europe so far. And he puts them together in Corinth where they're able to minister one to another. They were able to be a blessing and to be blessed by the other. And I want to say to you this morning that God knows your situation. And God knows best what you need in your situation. There are times when you feel like, I am I'm tired, Lord. I can't keep my head above water much longer. I've got about as much as I can handle. And then it seems like God's giving you something else. And you say, Lord... I can't take anymore. You need to take what God gives you because in the path of duty, there is blessing. As we obey, as we do those things that God would have us to do, God wanted Paul in Corinth, even though he was tired. God wanted Priscilla and Aquila in Corinth, even though they're displaced persons. And God brings them together and they're able to encourage one another. And so when you're tired, when you're wrung out, when you're on your last nerve and almost out of energy, and you feel like God is pushing you into something, go. Because it's in that place. God knows what you need. God can bring you together with someone who can be an encouragement. There are times you say, I, I, I can't talk to anybody else. I'm not going not gonna to talk to anybody else. And then your phone rings. Who knows but what that person may be calling you with a word of encouragement. And if you say, I'm not talking to anybody else today. You cut yourself off from a blessing. Walk with the Lord. As you're actively looking for who you can edify and encourage, even when you're tired, God will lead you to those who you can encourage and edify. One of the best ways to get your mind off of your current difficulties is to ask God to make you a blessing to others. Lord, I'm tired. So are they. Maybe we can help each other. And then I know it's been a recurring theme, not just in recent chapters, but through the whole book of Acts. But can you say, like Paul did, I'm clean. My, my hands are clean. When it comes to sharing the gospel, when Paul says I'm clean, he means I've faithfully spoken the gospel to everyone. Can you say that? Can, can you say that you've been faithful? 
We see the same responses today that Paul faced here almost 2,000 years ago. Some reject even today. Some reject even blasphemously, and they say, I don't want anything to do with your Jesus. But in so doing, they oppose themselves. But some are looking. I would make the case more than we think in America in 2024 are looking for a Savior. They're, they're looking in all the wrong places, but they know. I, I feel empty inside. I'm looking for something. And if you can come and share the Lord Jesus Christ with them, he's the only thing that can fill that hole in their heart. Are you faithful? Are you speaking up? We can't control the harvest. We can just faithfully minister in our portion of the field. God put us here for a reason. And, and there are people who you rub shoulders with on a regular basis who I don't know and may never meet. So, so if you're waiting on me to share the gospel with them, you're, you're going in the wrong direction. You share the gospel with them in such a way that when you get to the end of your life, you can say, look, I've done all that I can. I've shared the gospel with everyone who I could. That's what Paul was able to say, not just here in Corinth, but as we'll see later in Ephesus as well. What a testimony. May it be said of us as well. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Maybe you're here this morning and you're tired. I understand. If you're here this morning and you're tired and you, you feel like, I just, I just can't do much. I can't do anything else, certainly. I would encourage you, don't cut yourself off from a blessing by ignoring what God would have you to do. Take the time that you need to come apart, but keep busy sharing the gospel. Keep busy encouraging others speaking the truth. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, for the encouragement that it is to us. Lord, you know sometimes we are tired, sometimes we're spent, sometimes we're emotionally exhausted. But Lord, in those times, I pray that we wouldn't give up on the task to which you've called us. Lord, that we would be faithful, that we would be going about our business, about your business. And Lord, that we would trust you to send the encouragement that is to be found in the line of duty. Lord, I pray that you'd work in our hearts. Lord, if there's one here this morning who's never trusted you as personal Savior, I pray that today would be the day that they would accept the free gift that's offered to them through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.